is one that you know. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan. Come yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are. Wander much, whoever not leaving. Ours is no care of ever despair. Ours is no care of ever despair. Ours is no care of whoever you are. No care of ever to sway, comes no care to end of earth as baby, cause no care of and ever you swear, wander yes, you get lover of leaving, cause he's no care of ever to spare. Let us be called by bell and bird, by stars and streams, by the beat of our hearts. Let us be called together in covenant. Let us be called back to our true self, the co-arising web of existence which constitutes us and of which each of us is the whole entire web. Today with the bell sounding at Deer Park Monastery in California and the black-capped chickadee singing in many backyards, let us especially remember our covenant to affirm and promote the seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Morning. On the seventh Sunday of the season, we dedicate our chalice to the seventh principle of our faith, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. <clears throat> Will you please join me in the chalice lighting words? Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the realities and truth of existence, the splendor of action, the glory of power, the joy of achievement. For yesterday is but a memory and tomorrow merely a vision, but today, well lived, makes every yesterday a memory of gladness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Community Unitarian Universalist Congregation at White Plains, formerly Nonape Territory. I'm Catherine Cortland coming to you live from my home. I'm Tracy Brenneman, religious educator for this congregation, also coming to you from my home. It's a blessing you were born. It matters what you do. Your experience of the divine is true and you don't have to go it alone. Today is the seventh Sunday of summer. The 29.46 day old moon enters a new moon phase and the dark night sky offers clearer opportunities to view, view celestial objects. And a special welcome to our visitors. If you're a first time visitor, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. You will find a link to the order of service on our website at cucwp.org. There you will find other resources to help keep us connected during this time 
and a donate button. For July and August, our Share the Plate funds go to Furniture Share House, who collects gently used and new furniture to distribute free of charge to Westchester families in need. We are able to take contributions via the donate button for your pledge for the plate chair and for the minister's discretionary fund. Now please join us in singing the first three verses of hymn 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. words from On Being Org's Guide to Better Conversations. Hospitality is a bridge to all the great virtues, but it is immediately accessible. You don't have to love or forgive or feel compassion to extend hospitality, but it's more than an invitation. It is the creation of an inviting, trustworthy space, an atmosphere as much as a place. It shapes the experience to follow, it creates the intention, the spirit, and the boundaries for what is possible. As creatures, it seems, we imagine a homogeneity in other groups that we know not to be there in our own. But new social realities are brought into being over time by a quality of relationship between unlikely combinations of people. When in doubt, practice hospitality. Welcome is the very foundation of today's service as we will be talking about hospitality, which at its essence is the art of welcoming one another wholly into our homes and hearts. Let's start by making ourselves at home and relaxed in this space through a brief meditation. Please place your feet on the floor, sit up straight, look around and take note of your surroundings. Perhaps the view out of the window, or your home, or the screen we're sharing. Now close your eyes and visualize the room again. And let's breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and out. And one more time, breathe in, breathe out. As well, if you have your cell phones with you here, please take a minute to check and make sure the ringers and vibrators won't disturb you during service. As you silence those notifications and set the do not disturb, think to yourself or say aloud if you're so moved, thank you for reminding me of my friends, family, and colleagues. I will be back to you phone soon and all those you bring to me. Now, please join us for our sung invocation. We would be one as now we join in singing our hymn of love to pledge ourselves anew to that high cause of greater Oh. 
mission of Community Unitarian Universalist Congregation is the covenant of this congregation. Would all members and visitors who would like to affirm it along with me. We covenant to nurture each other in our spiritual journeys, foster compassion and understanding within and beyond our community and engage in service to transform ourselves and our world. lovely. Um, here are now some opening words, uh, starting with lines by Rumi regarding our hands and followed by words inspired by him. Your hand opens and closes, opens and closes. If it were always a fist or always stretched out, you would be paralyzed. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and expanding the two as beautifully balanced and coordinated as birds' wings. Your lungs open and close, open and close. If your lungs were always open or always closed, you would start choking. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and expanding, the two as beautifully balanced and coordinated as birds' wings. Your heart opens and closes and opens and closes. If your heart were always open or always closed, your blood would stop pumping. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and expanding, the two as beautifully balanced and coordinated as birds' wings. Madame and Monsieur, ladies and gentlemen, it is with deepest pride and greatest pleasure that we welcome you tonight. And now, we invite you to sit back and relax as the dining room proudly presents your dinner. Be our 
guest, be our guest. Tie a napkin round your chest. Try the service turn tonight, my dear, and we'll provide the best. Soup du jour, hot hors d'oeuvre. Why, we only live to serve. Try the gray stuff, it's delicious. Don't believe me? Ask the dishes. They can sing, they can dance. After all, miss, this is France. And a dinner here is never second best. Go on, unfold your menu. Take a glance and then you'll be our guest. We are guest, be our guest. Beef ragu, cheese souffle, pie and pudding on flambe. We'll prepare and serve with care a culinary cabaret. You're alone and you're scared, but the banquet's all prepared. No one's gloomy or complaining while the flatware's entertaining. We tell jokes, I do tricks with my fellow candlesticks. And it's all in perfect taste that you can bet. Come on and lift your glass. You've won your own free pass to be our guest. If you're stressed, it's fine dining we suggest. Be our guest, be our guest, be our guest. Hopla! Adiopa! Bravo! Candlelight still glowing, let us help you, we'll keep going. Course by course, one by one, till you shout enough, I'm done. Then we'll sing you off to sleep as you like that. Tonight, so put your feet up, but for now, let's be up, be our guest, be our guest, be our guest. Thank you. Uh, once again, a song about hospitality, one we maybe haven't thought about in that light. Um, before we begin, we'd like to have a, a brief prayer and then show, uh, share, excuse me, our joys, sorrows, and milestones. So in a spirit of prayer, I would say, uh, spirit of love, light, and healing, we bring our whole selves to this place, some in despair, longing for hope, others in joys they long to share. We hold you all in our hearts and support you in our journeys until you find what you seek. We are grateful for your presence here and for the presence of this community. We are grateful for glimmers of normalcy as the pandemic recedes and for the additional safety vaccines have brought. We're grateful to the athletes, broadcasters and organizers who have brought us the 2020 Olympics. And we are mindful of those suffering whom we cannot help directly, holding in our hearts, especially the hundreds of thousands of worldwide ill, dying, or dead from COVID and those who care for them. Those sheltering from or fleeing raging wildfires in the Western US, Turkey, and Greece, and the firefighters combating the infernos those victimized by sexual predators and those who seek justice on behalf of the victims. May we find sufficient strength in ourselves, our connections with each other and the things for which we are grateful to offer solace and our present to, presence to all those in need. And may we all find inspiration in Julian of Norwich, a famous female anchoress of the 14th century, calling out from the time of the Black Death to assure herself, her world, and now ours, all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. Amen. For all that has been said and for all we carry in our hearts, we'll have a silent meditation, then the musical meditation, and then sing along with the song re uh, sun response.
I wanted to talk for a minute today about the spiritual practice of loving kindness meditation. If you would please think of first someone perhaps a bit more distance from you, close your eyes for a moment, bring their image to mind, and then think for them or toward them. I'm grateful for the presence in my life of and wish peace, contentment, good health, and long life to that person. And then now try to think of somebody maybe closer at hand that you perhaps take for granted or always have with you or frequently think of. Uh, please think of that person, bring their image to mind and think again or say, I'm grateful for the presence in my life of and wish peace, contentment, good health and long life to that person. For now, lastly, think of yourself. Think that you're, think about how grateful you are to be here. And think, I'm grateful for the presence in my life of, and wish peace, contentment, good health, and long life to myself. This is a loving kindness meditation. There's different formulations of exactly what you say. But doing this for a few minutes each day does help you remember all the good people you have around you. And I do recommend it. All right. Well, today's sermon is uh, titled Hospitality, Lessons from the Pandemic and Ed Sheeran. Many of you may be thinking that the pandemic and hospitality are completely incompatible. And this title of the sermon is either oxymoronic or very gimmicky. And you might be right, because this is certainly the time to market what we learned from the pandemic. But for me, it's not just a gimmick. There's no doubt in my mind that the forced, sudden, and dramatic separation the pandemic has imposed and the choices we're forced to make and continue to make as it drags on remind us of the fundamental roots of hospitality in a way no Martha Stewart nor Rachel Ray could. So let's rewind the clock. Lockdown forced us suddenly into our homes, forbidden to go to work or restaurants, get our nails done or our hair. We were frightened to leave those homes, to shop, to go about our daily lives. Inviting anyone in seemed absolutely out of the question. And truly a retreat to our homes was a best case scenario. Many had no homes, lost their jobs, or found themselves and or friends and family ill or dying with the disease. But for those more, more fortunate who kept our homes and jobs, what was so difficult about the lockdown? What did we most yearn for? We learned, we long to connect with other people. Humans long to connect. We want to be together in real life, to be part of the social web with family, with friends, mingling, singing, dancing, or simply speaking. Even six feet apart feels too far. We want hugs, smiles, nudges at bad jokes, punch shoulders at a good one. Barring that, we wanna connect virtually, notwithstanding the time delays that impede our natural give and take and the ability to see at most only a virtual bust of our companions. Texting, old fashioned phone calls, or even letters beat long lasting isolation. This longing for in-person live connection that the pandemic laid bare is the foundation of hospitality. As the pandemic dragged on, what did we do? Well, we quite literally made decisions based on who we would invite and how, when every such invitation seemed suddenly fraught with the risk of becoming ill. Could we say no to our children? Suddenly moving in? If they came, should they quarantine? Wait, as parents, should we always welcome our children into our home? But what if they were doctors or nurses? Did we dare? What about elderly parents? Do we endanger them with our presence if we were even allowed into the retirement home? Or do we literally keep them at a safe distance and give up some of the time we would otherwise have with them in their final years? And what about shopping? In January 2020, whether to shop was a matter of scheduling and whether I needed anything. Walking into a store, 
salespeople were sort of hosts who would greet me like a guest with a smile and ask how they could help. Obviously, they welcomed shoppers and made them feel comfortable. Why else have a store? As spring 2020 progressed, welcoming customers like guests and seeing to their comfort could hardly be achieved due to the fear. The sales folks who had so cheerfully welcomed us previously were leery now. They felt they were risking their lives to be there. We customers felt the same. All of us, employees and customers, hosts and guests, asking ourselves, are we safe in the presence of others? If not, why are we here? So the pandemic presented us with the starkest, most basic questions of hospitality. Who do we welcome and what risk are we willing to take in doing so? Now, this is not a question we've associated with notions of hospitality in our times. Hospitality has many meanings and a Google search yields about 300 million results in just 0.7 seconds. And don't worry, I'm not going to list them all, but I do wanna take a few moments to consider what I mean by hospitality. I'm gonna start by excluding the hospitality industry, which loosely include, includes hotels, motels, inns, restaurants, and other food service businesses. And for the moment, I'd like to exclude large gatherings like fundraising, dinners, or corporate events, or receptions, and the like. I want to focus on the personal, or at least the small. Think of having visitors in your home, or visiting others in theirs, getting together for coffee, drinks, or a meal, or hosting or attending a party, having friends stay for a more extended visit. That's the type of hospitality I'm focusing on here. So during pandemic, having guests in our home was a risk. How is this a lesson of the pandemic? It's not a lesson. It's a terrible thing about the pandemic. It's new, a novelty, a development, a heartbreaking consequence of COVID and contagion. Oh, wait a minute. Is it really new? I mean, contagion's been out there a while. Egyptian papyri depicts small uh, patient, smallpox patients with little fogs near their faces showing contagion. Lepers were shunned and isolated from ancient times through the mid 20th century. So contagion isn't new, and from there it stands to reason that having guests has always presented risks. The history of the words guests and hosts and hospitality all bear this out. According to John McForder, the Lexicon Valley podcaster, these words have their origin in a Proto-European word from 5,000 years ago that sounded something like chost. Chost meant stranger, as in someone unknown. And the concept of chost or stranger morphed or extended into the concept of guest as in a stranger or somebody else you don't know, but you take in. And since you can't have a guest without someone to take them in, the same word became host as in the person taking in the stranger. How else did host morph? Well, as Kevin Stroud in his History of English podcast puts it, the guest was also a stranger which meant there was always a degree of uncertainty and possible hostility. Hostile and hostility also derive from host. So the concept of risk is baked into the words guest and host. A host can be hostile, guest can be hostile. Can anyone from Game of, can any Game of Thrones fans say Red Wedding? What this tells us is that for millennia, hospitality and risk have been intertwined. The question of who we risk connecting with is ancient. Neither guests nor hosts know what they are getting into. Do they have COVID? How about a cold? Will we like them? Are they mean? Will they say bad things about us on Facebook or Insta? Post a crappy picture of us for all the world to see? Make fun of our cooking, pictures, home? Why does this matter? Because it contrasts so completely with the notion that parties are always fun. And if you don't look forward to them, you have a confidence problem or some other issue. When you stop and realize that hospitality entails and has always entailed risk, well then obviously your apprehensions are normal. Here's an example. How do you feel when you open an invitation? Let's play it, say in the old times. Say an email ask at lunchtime asking you and some colleagues to drinks after work that evening. First, it's great to be included, so that beats them heading out without you. But then anxiety, dread, or even panic can set in. Are you dressed for it? Will your boss be there? Can you afford it? How will the bill be split? If you, don't, if you go but you don't drink, what will they think? Suppose you're the inviter, aka the host on this one. 
You're not anxious because you control the situation. It's your idea, right? Actually, the host has her own anxieties. What if no one comes? Do they not like the idea or just not like you? Do you include the boss or don't? What about the three people who always walk out for lunch together and swear they never plan to? It's always by accident every day. Will anyone post something snarky on Insta or tweet out how, how dull the drinks are? For those who enjoy their colleagues in a drink, go for it. But for many, Ed Sheeran put it best. I'm at a party I don't want to be at, and I never wear a suit and tie, wondering if I can sneak out the back and no one's even looking me in my eyes. I'm riddled with anxiety. This is not where I'm supposed to be. Don't think I fit in at this party. Everyone's got so much to say. I always feel like I'm nobody. So who wants to fit in anyway? So you get the idea, even Ed Sheeran has party problems. Absent pandemic, we seldom worry about our physical safety when visiting people in their homes. Rather social risks like fear of rejection, being made fun of or missing out altogether loomed large. These, like physical risks, also date back through the millennia to different societies. Hospitality risks, physical and or social, and the resulting anxieties there are therefore ancient and not new. Most importantly, anxiety about gathering is utterly and completely normal. If you're an anxious guest or a hesitant host, you are normal. Even though we have this popular notion of Saturday night raucous parties with happy, good-looking, carefree people as the epitome of social life, the fact is that nerves are the norm because the risks are real. In the face of these risks, these anxieties, our longing for connection calls us to gather, to yearn for an open and generous welcome with or in the face of the risk that entails. So how do we do this? In a word, hospitality. So we left off with anxiety and risk in the one hand and a yearning to connect on the other. The distance between anxiety and yearning to connect could be a canyon, a chasm, a hole, or just a dip so shallow that a cape thrown across it is sufficient to bridge it. That distance will depend on your mindset, other guest mindset, and the host mindsets, and of course, on the actual circumstances. For hospitality to bridge the distance, a host must offer hospitality and the guest accept it gracefully. On Being's website defines hospitality as the creation of an inviting, trustworthy space, an atmosphere as much as a place. It shapes the experience to follow. It creates the intention, the spirit, and the boundaries for what is possible. So what do our COVID circumstances teach us about even a more typical gathering when people are more focused on fun and dangers like COVID are strictly in the background or perhaps not even on the mind at all? Well, first, safety is the foundation of an inviting and trustworthy space of comfort and warm welcome. People who feel unsafe cannot be comfortable. Think of our opening song, one of our songs, excuse me, the singer sleeping in clover, drinking sweet wine, not forgetting for a million tomorrows, all the joy that is mine today. That sensation of comfort and joy requires physical safety for its foundation. In many religions, the host responsibility to ensure safety and comfort are sacred. Hospitality is a cornerstone of the Sikh religion. Every temple has a large dedicated space for hosting meals to all in the community who appear. The practice is known as Langar. During COVID and other emergencies like fires and earthquakes worldwide, Sikhs have welcomed thousands for meals in a unique blend of hospitality and service to others that insists on treating everyone as equals, regardless of where in society or a caste system they may fall. The Christian religion also enshrines hospitality. The rule of St. Benedict required that all guests who present themselves are to be welcome as Christ, for he himself will say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. In fact, the abbot was required to welcome them, not just any monk. Regarding Islamic hospitality, commentator Aisha Stacy observed, in Islam, the hospitality relationship is triangular. It consists of host, guest, and God. Hospitality is a right rather than a gift, and the duty to supply it is a duty to God. Islam emphasizes a symbiotic relationship of the host and the hosted or the guest. The host's obligations are to provide the best treatment for one day 
and then hospitality for three days total. As to the guests, the prophet is quoted as saying, quote, and it is not lawful for a guest to stay with his host for such a long period as to put him in a critical position. Again, the responsibility of the host to offer safety and comfort is balanced with the responsibility of the guest to bear in mind the conditions of his host and not burden him with what he cannot afford or provide. As the Muslim tradition recognizes, hosts cannot single-handedly create an inviting, trustworthy space solely on their own. Guests must cooperate. The roles of guest and host are complementary, one offering safety and comfort and the other accepting it and by doing so providing comfort and reinsurance back to the host and other guests. The complementary nature of their roles, like our hands closed in a fist or open to reach out or our hearts opening and closing in order to keep beating, create the atmosphere. In larger gatherings, guests are in a sense also hosting one another. If your hosts welcome you and take your coat, but the first guest you meet sneers, you will not feel yourself to be in a trustworthy, inviting space. Each guest smiling and conversing respectfully with another is acting both as guest and host to perpetuate the intention or spirit of the party. So during a pandemic, how do hosts and guests meet these obligations, whether sacred to them or an outgrowth of just the natural inclination to gather and connect? How do you provide, quote, friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers, as the, I think the American Heritage Dictionary says? First step, communication. As hosts, uh, my husband Chris and I discussed our plans for mutual safety with our guests along with the date and time details. We asked them if there was anything else they wanted us to do. We held our bid and bump dinner on the deck using the usual deck furniture and a card table and many TV trays so that guests could be six feet apart. We asked whether they wanted to wear masks themselves and whether they wanted us to. We used gloves and masks when serving food and clearing the table, and we gave everyone their own bento boxes with their appetizers and plated the meal on paper plates, separate everything to minimize physical contact, no crowds gathering around the table to serve themselves, and no need to worry about sterilizing or cleaning plates. And our guests did two things. First, those who came cooperated, they stayed six feet apart. They approached the drinks table one at a time and still conversed and laughed and enjoyed themselves. Second, we had guests who self-selected. Some, whether because of their own health, family pressures to stay isolated or other reasons, simply could not get comfortable with the idea of being anywhere but home. They didn't come. And we respected their decisions without reserve. Despite COVID, we all enjoyed ourselves. Together with our guests, we created a safe, inviting atmosphere for all. And as we talked about in the first half of the sermon, even without COVID, gatherings produced anxiety. Who do I know? Will they like me? What do I wear? How will I look on Insta tomorrow? I don't ever wear a suit and tie. Can I sneak out the back? It takes hosts and guests together to alleviate these anxieties and create an inviting, trustworthy space. So what can you do? Well, as a host, the first step in my mind is to relax yourself, invite people you're comfortable with, or mentally prepare yourself for people to be themselves, especially if you know they're sometimes difficult. They're not gonna stop being themselves just because they crossed your threshold for a party. In terms of prep, food and space, do what makes you comfortable. You love cooking, play on a feast. Not such a great cook, Go with cheese, crackers, and nuts. You love decorating? Bring on the glitter. Not big on bling? Tidy up a little bit. Do what makes you feel comfortable. Ask for help from your guests, and if they help without asking, thank them with a smile, even if the sink encounters are already full. What about guests? Well, first, if you tend to be shy or anxious, try to find strategies that work for you. Personally, at a party where I don't know many people, I make it a point to meet three people. Why three? Well, I'm a little shy at heart, but I can get to three. It's attainable. Once I get there, I feel relaxed. I feel like I accomplished my mission and then I can enjoy the party more. Another strategy is to find out what your host or a few of the other guests are interested in and ask about that. That might take some advanced planning. For example, when I first met my son-in-law's family, 
he had told me about his brother who was getting a master's degree in entomology, so the study of bugs. So I kept an ear out for bug stories on the news to ask him when, to ask him about when we had dinner with that family for the first time. That was probably the only time I was glad to know about West Nile virus. Last for guests, don't feel compelled to go just because you were invited and hosts don't take it personally if they don't come. My roommate from college didn't come to our daughter's wedding. She explained to me that she's had enough of being a single woman at a wedding reception. I accept that unreservedly. And this is another point. As hosts, part of respecting your guests and providing comfort is maintaining your relationship with them, even if they decide not to come to the gathering. Last suggestion for both hosts and guests is try to focus on why you're there. Focusing on your purpose, say wanting to meet new people or catch up with friends, can help you get your mind away from the anxieties crowding in. COVID has vividly demonstrated that the safety of any party depends on the complementary roles of host and guests, not just one or the other. That is simply the physical manifestation of the complementary role, social roles of guests and hosts being essential for the spark that turns a gathering into a festivity with a warm and inviting atmosphere. At any party, there's a sense in which guests host one another, smiling and chatting together, generating the energy we love and so desperately miss during COVID times. And as a last thought, I would say, try thinking about all your interactions as a chance to briefly offer hospitality. You will be amazed at how much more you enjoy work discussions or even just talking to a cashier when you treat those interactions as moments to welcome people, however briefly, into your life. May your life always be a party. Be well. Now please join Catherine for our chalice extinguishing words as you extinguish your chalice at home. It's likely that every day presents an opportunity for you to practice radical hospitality to someone with whom you cross paths. There is no shortage of people who could use the fit of a caring, welcoming person in their life. If you expect to be that person, you'll be surprised how often the opportunities come for you to show love through hospitality. You're busy. You don't have the skill set. Their problems are too much. Their life is a mess. Your life is a mess. You're too impatient. You're not kind enough. You don't even like them. You have nothing to offer. What does it really matter? Turns out in the end, it's all that really matters. I'd like to paraphrase an Irish prayer. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we welcome each other again, virtually or physically, in heart and mind, may your guiding spirit hold you in the palm of their hand as we, your spiritual community, welcome and hold you in our souls. Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs> Friend.